Hi everyone! Welcome or welcome back to my channel. I am Sean and today I am doing a January reading wrap up. So let's get into it. So I am starting out this month with a lot of DNFs because the books I decided to read this year, a lot of them I knew very early on were just not working out for me. Beginning with James Joyce, Dubliners. So this book was on my 23 books to read in 2023 and I read precisely zero words. I did not read any of it. What I wound up doing is I was reading part of the introduction, which usually I wouldn't do, but for whatever reason I did. And I read that in this book, in this edition, they do not use quotation marks for dialogue because apparently in his later works, James Joyce started omitting quotation marks. So that's what the editor of this book did is he wrote the dialogue without quotation marks to be more in line with James Joyce's later style. So if you've seen my channel before, you may know I am a huge advocate against not using quotation marks. I think every book needs to have quotation marks for dialogue. If a book doesn't do that, I just don't really want to read it. I find it so distracting. And I also think the authors who do this are probably like pretty arrogant because they just think like, oh no, I'm not going to use quotation marks because I'm just such a great writer and everybody loves me. So I'm going to be lazy and not even do it. And I just hate that. I think every book needs to have quotation marks for dialogue. It's so distracting without it. So there was that issue, which by itself, that pretty much made this book a DNF. But along with that, I knew that James Joyce is a stream of consciousness writer. I have tried several stream of consciousness writers before, and I have hated every single one of them. I've given each book by a stream of consciousness writer one star. J.D. Sollinger, William Faulkner, Virginia Woolf, Samuel Beckett. I just hate stream of consciousness writing. I cannot get into it. To me, stream of consciousness writing reads like the author sat down at a typewriter or computer or whatever it was in their day. They just wrote whatever in one or two days as a first draft and then published it. They did it without thought. They did it without effort. They just wrote down whatever and sent it to the publisher. I do not respect that at all as a writing form. Like I say, I could write what these writers do, stream of consciousness writers do, in one or two days without effort, just typing whatever is a first draft and it would be the same quality as these books. It's just garbage. It should not really be respected. And I don't respect it as a reader or as a writer. So stream of consciousness writing is just a no-go for me, really. I just do not like it. I did a Google search for like stream of consciousness writers. And one of them, unfortunately, was Marcel Proust, who is on my to read list. This book is Swan's Way is on the thousand books to read list by James Moustich. A thousand books to read before you die. And Marcel Proust is one of the stream of consciousness consciousness writers. So knowing that, I will probably give this book as well a very short leash. Hopefully it uses quotation marks. It does, thank God. But anyway, since it's a stream of consciousness writer, I may give this book like just 20 pages to give it a genuine honest effort. And if I'm just not into it, I'll probably just DNF it real quick. But that's not really a point right now. The point is I do not like stream of consciousness writers and I hate books that do not have quotation marks. James Joyce does both. So screw that. I don't even want to read this. I just know I will not like it. So screw that DNF without even trying one single word of it. I know that may sound extreme like how do I know I won't like it? Still, there is like no writer has like a right that they have to be read. So even though it is a well-regarded book and it's on the top 1000 list, that does not mean I have to read it. So I just do not like stream of consciousness writing. I don't want to read books without quotation marks. So screw that. I just don't want to read it. So goodbye. That probably goes for all of James Joyce's writing as well. I just don't want to get into it. So no. I. It's a hard limit for me. I'm not doing it. I will die on this hill. Next, another book that was on my 23 books to read in 2023 list, 
Leaves of Grass by Walt Whitman. I was pretty low expectations for this book because I do not like poetry, but for whatever reason I thought this book was a novel and I think the reason I thought that was maybe I just like flipped through the first pages and it looked like it was prose, like it was actual text, a novel. I think what I may have been reading when I did that was like the introduction because as soon as I like flipped to chapter one I saw nope this is just a collection of poetry. I do not like poetry. What I did for this book is I tried birds. I tried to read the first line of about five random poems in the book like the first poem in the book and then I skipped like 20 pages and I tried the first line of another poem, skipped 20 pages, tried the first line of another poem. When I, for, for each poem, I could not really even get halfway through the first line without being bored to death. I just do not like poetry. I am extremely selective about it. Like the only poet I would say I really like would be like Shel Silverstein. This though, I just can't get into it. It is not for me. I do not like poetry. The way Sheldon Cooper in The Big Bang Theory, the TV show, the way he views geology is how I view poetry. I just do not really respect it as an art form. And I know that may be pretty extreme to say, but still it's just like, I do not really like poetry. I don't understand who would really get into it. To me, it is just meaningless garbage. It's just words thrown together and they don't really have a meaning and then people are like, oh, I think I can deduce the meaning of this. And it's just meaningless to me. It's just trash. So, so I just hate poetry. I can't get into it. So for the previous book, James Joyce, I gave that book one star. For this one, I'm just going to leave it unrated because poetry is just really not for me. I can't say it's actually bad or that he does anything wrong. I know a lot of people like this book and like his poetry, but it's just not for me. So unrated, not for me. I tried a few poems, the first few lines. I just couldn't get into it. And there are several poems in this book. It's like a 400 page book. So I just know I cannot read this. So DNF. Next, another book that was on my 23 books to read in 2023 list. This House of Sky by Ivan Doig. Let's put this up here. So there are like 20 signed books by Ivan Doig at the bookstore. And if you've seen my channel, you know what a sucker I am for signed books. What I was planning to do since this is one of the books on the top 1000 list, 1000 books to read before you die, I wanted to read this book first and then if I liked it, I would go back to the bookstore and get a signed book by him. But I was really pessimistic because the subtitle of this book is Landscapes of a Western Mind. So Ivan Doig kind of wrote about like nature and the wilderness, which is just pretty boring to me. As I started this book, I realized it was actually like autobiographical. And that's another thing I don't like is autobiographies. However, I still gave it a chance and I read the first chapter and I actually really liked the first chapter. I was thinking this could potentially be a five star book. The writing was just very good. The plot was well done. The storytelling was well done. So I was thinking, hmm, maybe this is actually pretty good. There was one major red flag in the book, and that is that Ivan Doig used a lot of italics. Like half of the writing is in italics. And if you've seen my channel before, you may know I do not like italics in books. Birds! I'm sorry they're noisy this video. We all just woke up, so we're all ready for the day and ready to go and chirpy chirp. Anyway, where was I? So the first chapter was really good. I was thinking this could be a five star book. I was thinking maybe I am going to want a signed book by this guy. But there was a lot of italics. Still, in spite of that, I kept reading even though there was so much of them because I just wanted to give him a good chance because I wanted to find out if I want to get a signed book by this guy. So I kept reading and then in the second chapter, I thought the narrative just kind of fell apart. The book became very random. The first chapter, kind of a little minor spoiler warning, but the first chapter is about the death of his mother. So it was 
all very compact. It was focused. The narrative was focused. But after that, it just kind of kept jumping around. And I just lost my connection with the book, with the writing. And that's when the italics also became more of a problem. Because every time there is italic, or every time there are italics in books, I kind of want to just skip it, skip whatever's in italics. And in the end, that's kind of inevitably what I started doing. And I just lost interest in the book. I thought it lost its focus and I just lost my interest. So, good first opening chapter. I liked it. I thought it had potential, but after that, I thought it just lost its focus and the italics became more and more of an issue. And in the end, after like 25 pages or so, it was all going in one ear and out the other. So I think it's just not for me. I don't remember if I rated this book on Goodreads or not. I may have given it two or three stars actually just for the first chapter. I don't know, potentially. Actually, I think I may have given it one star. In fact, I think I did because I think Ivan Doig passed away. So my view is kind of I don't really mind giving bad reviews to dead writers because it's not going to hurt their feelings. It's not going to hurt their career. They're already dead. So I think I actually gave it one star. I just didn't like it. So anyway, I guess I would still say if italics don't really bother you, it may be worth trying because like I say, the first chapter was pretty good. Maybe the rest of the book is good as well. It's just the italics was a problem for me. So if that doesn't bother you, I think it may be worth trying, but it's not for me. So DNF'd after like 25, 30, 40 pages. Okay, the fourth book on the January wrap-up is Candidi by Voltaire. You may have noticed in my 23 books to read in 2023 list, I had a different book for Candidi than this one. What I wound up doing is I lost it, so I had to go to the bookstore. Unfortunately, they had this other copy, so I got it instead. So this was my first read by Voltaire, and basically what I knew about Voltaire is he was a highly quoted guy around the time of Thomas Jefferson, I think. That's really all I knew about him. I thought he was very, like, anti-religious, which I found out indeed was true. But I didn't know anything about this book otherwise. It is on the Top 1000 list by James Moustich. So, as I started not knowing anything about the book, started reading it, it did not really take me long to form an opinion of the book, and this is an opinion I had throughout the book. So I read the whole thing. So this was actually not a DNF. I read the whole thing. Yay! But it's a real short book. To cut to the chase, this book reads like an anti-religious Princess Bride meets Gulliver's Travels. In short, the book is kind of Voltaire's response to apparently a philosopher of his day basically had this mantra that everything is for the best. You know, everything is okay. Everything that happens happens for a good reason. And Voltaire kind of came out and said, no, that's not true. Things are pretty crappy in this world sucks. There's war, there's death, there's misery, there's breakup and things don't go right, things suck. And so that's kind of what this story is about. It follows this character throughout like Europe and the Americas on this adventure where things just keep going wrong, but he still kind of thinks like, oh, I'm gonna have a happy ending, right? Things are gonna work out in the end. That's what my philosopher friend always said, who said everything is always for the best. And so that's kind of what Voltaire is doing. So basically this book was very anti-religious, I think. And a couple things about it. First off, I think this book would be difficult to fully appreciate because in his day, I could see how this book would be much more taboo, pushing the envelope, much more controversial, much more scandalous. Today, that doesn't really carry over so much. That does not like dilute the enjoyment of the book. It's still an enjoyable book, but just the book doesn't seem as scandalous now as it would have been in Voltaire's time. So that kind of weakens it a little bit. I can imagine whoever read this book when it first came out, it would have been quite a hoot, but that doesn't quite carry over today. The other thing I'd say about the book really is that I didn't think there were any especially funny or memorable moments 
that would just like stick with me forever. So it's not like Gulliver's Travels where there was parts that made me laugh out loud. There were kind of humorous moments to it and still some kind of like shocking moments. But it wasn't anything that I think would really be like a masterpiece level. So because of that, I give Candidi, I may be mispronouncing that, but no surprise if I do. I give it four stars. Overall, I think it's a pretty decent read. Mainly what I would recommend it for is if you are at the library or if you're at the bookstore and nothing else really jumps out at you, there's nothing you're really dying to read, nothing that's been like heavily recommended to you. I think it's a decent book to pick up. So not something you should rush out and buy and look for or whatever, but if you happen to see it and you don't have anything else you're really tempted to get, it's not a bad book. So I would kind of recommend it then. And it's a short read, so if you want to get a bit of an advantage on your reading goals for the year, it's not a bad book. You should be able to read it in a day or two or three or whatever. I'm a slow reader and I read it in like four sittings or so, so pretty easy read. Also, I thought Voltaire might be more like intellectual, wordy, boring. It really wasn't though. So the book read kind of a lot like Princess Bride or Gulliver's Travels. So anyway, not a bad book. I'm glad I read it. Four stars. Last for the January reading wrap up is Michael Crichton, A Case of Need. Okay, so I have read a lot of Michael Crichton books. I don't know how many offhand I would guess like 10 or 12 or so. And I kind of have a mixed opinion about Michael Crichton. I think the first few books I read from him I really enjoyed. Namely Jurassic Park, Airframe, The Lost World, um, The Great Train Robbery, Congo wasn't too bad. After that though I kind of just his books don't really work out for me. They kind of feel like the same thing. My opinion of Michael Crichton is kind of like my opinion of Nicholas Sparks. I really liked the first few books I read by Nicholas Sparks, but after that they just don't really work for me. Kind of my guess is if you're like me, whichever first books you read by him you may enjoy. You may like his writing style, the way he unfurls his plots and his intricate plots and all that. Whichever book you read from him you may enjoy pretty well. But after that they just kind of lose their steam I guess. They all kind of read like the same thing. Like I've already read this same book. I know where it's going. It's not as surprising. You're not as interested in it. But is the book actually bad? I don't know. I think it's just you kind of get tired of his writing style because it's always kind of the same. So I was pretty pessimistic about this book. I've had it for several years and it's just kind of been collecting dust. But I wanted to read it just so really I could get rid of it and make space for other books on my shelf. Now this book is actually one of Crichton's first books and he actually wrote it under a pen name at the time. And Michael Crichton if you don't know he kind of came from like a hospital background like he was studying to be a doctor or he actually was a doctor. I don't know exactly. So his first few books were more like medical related and this book in particular deals with a woman who apparently had an abortion and she dies and it's kind of a mystery about who did the abortion. They blame this like Chinese American doctor I think. I think he's Chinese. I don't know. Asian of some kind. The book is also set in like the 1960s so abortion is legal at the time. Now I have very strong views on abortion so I was really nervous about reading this because I know Michael Crichton kind of likes to push his own views on things in his books and he also writes like essays at the end of some of his books which I read and I pretty much disagreed with what he was saying. But anyway, so I was nervous about the book because I was just like, uh, this is going to be like propaganda sort of and I'm not going to like it. So the whole time as I was reading, I was kind of waiting for Michael Crichton to just kind of start sermonizing about his views and I would just not want to read anymore. However, as I was reading this book, I was actually really liking the pacing of the book. It really reminded me of two Michael Crichton books in particular, both of them that I really liked. 
The first would be Airframe, and the second is The Great Train Robbery. They read very similar to this book. So if you've read either of those books, I especially recommend Airframe. That's probably my favorite book by Michael Crichton. It just reads very similar to it, just the pacing of it. It's kind of, each chapter kind of has cliffhanger endings, and it makes you wonder just like, what is going on? What is the truth here? And I just really like it. I think Michael Crichton actually was really good at that. He didn't do that kind of style for a lot of his books. He kind of started writing more like techno books. But for some of these books, Airframe, The Great Train Robbery, and this one, he kind of has more like a fast paced novel. The other books can kind of be more like slow paced, really intricate, detailed, techno stuff, stuff about technology or science or whatever. But these books in particular are more fast paced and I enjoy them. I enjoy the pacing. I think that's all really well done. So throughout the book, I was enjoying this. I was enjoying the pacing. I was on the edge of my seat wondering how it would end. And that would really be the main question for me was what does Crichton do in the end of this book? Because he builds so much suspense about who is responsible for the death of this woman? Did she have an abortion? Why? And all this stuff. So I thought the rating of the book would depend heavily on the outcome of the book, what Crichton does in the end, if it's a surprise or not. Because there were a few things that I was thinking, oh, if Crichton does this in the end of the book, I'm just going to hate that. That is so expected. If he does that, it's going to drop the rating severely. And anyway, just to cut it short, I wasn't upset with the ending. I wouldn't say it's like anything that blew me away or just surprised me or anything, but it wasn't anything that let me down either. I do think it maybe came off a bit rushed, like Crichton was like, okay, I got to wrap this book up now. So it did feel a little anticlimactic in that way, but it wasn't bad enough where I thought, oh, this made the whole book useless. It made my whole reading it pointless. It was still an enjoyable read and I enjoyed it all the way through. So, as I say, Michael Crichton is kind of an author. His books are either hit or miss to me. This one I would call a hit. And I would really compare it again to Airframe and The Great Train Robbery. So if you like either of those books, and I recommend either of those books, I would also recommend this book along with it. So, it is about abortion. Yes, that was a major red flag. And even though I have very strong views on abortion, there was no part of it that really made me tempted to just throw this book against the wall. So overall, basically what I'd say about this book is it's just pretty well done. The pacing of it is really good. It's an edge of your seat book. So I do recommend it. I forget what I gave it on Goodreads. Just offhand now though, I would probably say I would give it four stars. So it wouldn't be at the top of my list for Michael Crichton recommendations. First has to be Airframe and Jurassic Park. And then the next tier would probably be like The Great Train Robbery, maybe Congo, definitely The Lost World. And then this book would probably fit in there as well. If you haven't read Michael Crichton before, I would recommend it Jurassic Park and Airframe first. If you have read Michael Crichton if you, and you've not read this book yet, I would recommend it. Hey y'all, it's me. I just wanted to say one more thing about Case of Need. I am kind of giving it a free pass in a lot of ways about like the characterization of the book. I mean, there's a lot I could say about the characters and I guess like the morality of the book or the message of the book, because basically in the book, the characters are all not really likable. Every single one of them really has significant flaws, like either like they're racist or they're sexist or misogynist or whatever. Every single character really. So that could be a major problem. But I kind of give Michael Crichton a free pass on this. I don't really know why. Maybe it's because it was one of his earlier books. Even though I know he should have known better, like there's no reason even if this book is written in like the 1960s, why he couldn't have more like
progressive characters who are not just all racists or misogynists or whatever. To me, the thing that stands out about the book was the pacing. That is what I liked and I enjoyed reading it. So if I was judging the book based more on like the likability of the characters and the tone of the book, like the message of the book for the time, yeah, I would have more problems with it. But I didn't really consciously think that too much as I read it. I knew that these characters were kind of unlikable and racists and sexists and all that, but it didn't take away from my enjoyment of the book. So because of that, I kind of give the book a free pass in that regard. So if you do read this book, that might be more of an issue for you than it was for me, but that is something to be aware of. So I do want to acknowledge that there are problems with the book for the characters, the likability and all that, but it didn't take away from my personal enjoyment of the book. So anyway, that is it for the January reading wrap up. So thank you guys for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.